Kamrul. Sir, sure, just uh, start your talks after 10 seconds. Okay. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, dear participants. Rather, it's a bit late today. So today is our 67th lecture session. And today's our topic is ECG in ischemia infarction. Uh, our, late, our speaker is Professor Chaudhary Hafiz Asan, sir. And before the start of the lecture, I'd like to request M. Atharali, sir, to introduce Chaudhary Hafiz Asan, sir, among our uh, participants. And then we proceed. Atharali, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tushar, and uh, good evening to our, all of our faculties and participants. Dear participants, today's presenter is Professor Choudhury Hafizul Ahasan. Professor Choudhury is a clinical professor of medicine, University of Nevada. He is already well known in this forum. He does not need any introduction. Professor Choudhury is already known to our participant as an exceptional presenter. We always enjoy his presentation. He is outstanding in knowledge and skill. He's a very brilliant academic career, outstanding in knowledge and skill. He loves this country and we love him. Today's presenter is Professor Choudhury Hafizul Hassan. Everybody is waiting for his presentation. Dear participants, this is Professor Choudhury Hafizul Hassan. Wow, that was a huge introduction. <laughs> so let me see. Once I disconnect, I get scared about this. Uh, uploading. I'm trying to find my EKG slide set. Good. Okay, so um, I'm actually complimenting my um, I'm complimenting my fellows and uh, also uh, our uh, two EP attending, um, Dr. Gururaj and Dr. Namazi. So my role is very minimal when I attend the EP class. Every week we have an EP class on Tuesday. So I just, in other days, um, I have to uh, be active, like CAT conference or in uh, general cardiology uh, journal club, but EP conference, I take a cup of coffee and then relax and I just uh, enjoy the fight. So today I'm just presenting that 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 uh, EKG set. So I really acknowledge the fellows and the attendings from that conference. 46 year old motor vehicle accident. We at level one trauma center. So we get a lot of uh, consults from them. So um, this was the EKG of that patient. So diagnosis, anyone. Is there a Nepali friend, friends from Nepal? So this looks like sinus tachycardia. And then question is, is there something else possible? Is it possible to be a tail tack? The heart rate is 150, the, the ventricular rate. And some people say, okay, if it is 150, maybe it's a tail flutter two to one. But the question is how you differentiate this. Hafiz, why didn't you call somebody from from here, Ab Ab okay. So, yeah, I was waiting. As a, Dr. Abida, can you participate, Dr. Abida? Unmute, please. It's a very simple EKG. Oh, 
or anyone from Nepal or anyone? By the, uh, by the way, Rafiq, my uh, pressure is on you now. I'm very encouraged. 79 participants. Right. Sir, Bishal so, Swift has raised his hand. Yeah, he is. Can I try, sir? Yeah, sure, Bishal. Yes, welcome. Yes, thank you, sir. So, here is... Sir, am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So... Hello? Yeah. Yes, Vishal, we can hear you. Vishal, yes, please. So, there is a patient with uh, the QRS, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> These are two-way lead ECG with rhythm lead strip uh, showing probably taken in uh, standard limb, standard speed and voltage showing narrow QRS complex, regular tachycardia at the rate of around 150 bits per minute. And uh, we can see the P wave is inverted in three. And... Uh, the P wave is uh, operated in two and uh, biophasic in V1 and uh, operated in AVR. Mm -hmm. So it might be either coming from near the, either coming from ESA node or near the ESA node. Uh, and uh, as the rate is uh, 150, so I would like to consider uh, uh, other tachycardia also besides uh, just sinus tachycardia. Like uh, no. I, I, can, I can consider, yes. Okay. So your Go primary ahead. diagnosis is sinus tachycardia, right? Yes, sir. My primary diagnosis okay. is sinus. Anybody else wants to talk about it? Small point. Look at the very far end. There is a calibration. So I, I tell my fellows that and tell them about this conference in the morning that the, the participants from Nepal, they are very particular about the speed check and also the calibration. And you can look at the oh, very yeah. far yes. end of the EKG. There is a calibration. When you are looking at all the leads at the very far end, look at the calibration. Sometimes the EKG tech can speed up to 50 millimeter per second, and then it will look like wide QRS. So calibration is important. Thank you so much. Sir, P wave seems to be negative in lead two, sir. This is unlike in sinus tech, sir. Yeah, well, this is the problem. The problem is two is looks upright, but three and AVF yes, doesn't sir. look upright. And if you look at V1 to V3, it's inverted, which kind of goes against sinus tachycardia. So it's a long RP tachycardia. And so long RP tachycardia differential diagnosis, of course, is sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, and atypical AVNRT. Um, if it are a typical AVNRT, 2, 3 AVF should have been negative and V1 should have been positive with a sharp, narrow P wave, which it is not. So I think it's most likely, Hafiz, you go ahead then. No, to support what you just said, I show you the EKG now when he's in sinus rhythm. So remember Rafik Bhai said about the uh, P wave in two and three, and then V1, V2. Now look in sinus is distinctly positive. So, I so I go back to the previous ECG. Uh, it's very important in V1, there's negative P wave, but there's not biphasic, not typical biphasic. If it yeah. were typical by physics, then it would have been surely uh, sinus tachycardia. So, you know, I, I was thinking, why this, uh, does, does it matter? But it, it can matter because uh, if it is remain same, then the therapy is also very important. So uh, this is the rhythm strip and they get frequent calls from the tele. So that's why I thought that this is important to show. And if you want to follow the uh, P wave algorithm, this is actually revised, you believe it or not, um, that how, uh, what just Ravik Bhai said about the V1, lead V1 and then lead 2, 3 AVF, look at this, how it can help you to identify whether this is uh, coming from the 
tricusp is annulus or right atrium or for that matter in the left side. Um, it's, if you're interested, you can look at this uh, from this circulation, 2021 Kistler said this. Um, but let me go to the next uh, uh, patient. But before that, uh, one thing I thought is important that how you face this practically, that if it is atrial tack, atrial tack, and then not sinus or or ectopic atrial tack, or is it uh, a, a typical AV nodal DNT tack? If the patient is usually they tolerate the blood pressure was good, but if you want to control the rate, if you know because sinus tachycardia we normally don't want to treat. We don't want to treat the. We want to treat the underlying cause. So if it is, if you know that there is differential, and you can control, then you can try medications to control it. So important thing is this one. This is a 57 year old coming with lightheadedness, previous history of cabbage, hyperlipidemia, and diabetic. And then when he came to the hospital. Uh, he has COVID positive, but no typical symptoms. Uh, so COVID is not a big issue. And this is the EKG. And I give you, I, this later part, I, I challenge you because Friday evening is our weekend starts. So this, I, I make fun about this. This is a 4.30 in the afternoon and you are on call and you've got this EKG, what do you want to do now? Any volunteers, please? May I try, sir? Again, Vishal, right. Yes, sir. This is a true LED CG with a... Yeah, strip, uh, rhythm strips uh, taken in PNMM for millivolt and standard showing <coughs> showing uh, P wave at the different rate than QRS wave with uh, with complete desynchrony and QRS wave showing alternating uh, RVV and LVV pattern. Especially we can see in V1. So I'll think it is a advanced uh, conduction disease uh, with complete all block. And I'll I'll pace I'll do temporal pacing in this kind of patient. What, what do you mean by advanced? I mean blocking? there is both uh, alternating RVV, LVV as well as uh, complete heart block. Do, do you uh, think uh, there is uh, this this? Do you think there is uh, conduction? No, sir. This uh, uh, what I mean to say is this. Uh, Escape rhythm is coming either once from left ventricle and once from right ventricle. I think yeah. so. So this signifies very uh, unstable patient. Might it might uh, be very unstable patient? He might develop ERC. Might develop complete arrest or. And Brady induced BTBF soon. So I'll take this, consider this, and do uh, early TPI or pacemakers. And uh, obviously, the beta blockers uh, will be stopped. And if there is any. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh the beta blocker, do you think the beta blocker is causing it? No, sir. I don't think this is the cause, but but still uh, at present, I'll uh, I'll hold it. And again, after uh, insertion of pacemaker, I'll build up it as a other case. As in other yeah. case. So there's a problem with beta blocker because beta blocker, every time somebody comes with heart block, people worry about the beta blocker. Please, you have to remember something that beta blocker works more on adrenergic receptors. AV node influence on the beta blocker influence on the AV node is not great. So it is very, very unlikely for a beta blocker to cause complications. I'm not talking about this case. This case, 
it's a very, very low dose. But even if somebody has 100 milligram BID of metoprolol and comes with complete heart block, and the heart sinus rate is what it is here, it is unlikely to be beta blocker because if the beta blocker is causing it, it will first cause extreme sinus bradycardia. And it may cause, very unlikely, but still can cause, but you will have underlying marked sinus bradycardia if that's due to beta blocker. Thank you. So this is the analogy I give. Patient took aspirin, had a GI and upper GI bleed. You stop the aspirin, but still do endoscopy. Aspirin may be precipitating, but aspirin is not the, the underlying issue is there. The analogy may not be great, but that's the way I take it. And this is the reason I showed that this is at 4.30 in the afternoon on a Friday. Question is, will you stop the beta blocker and watch or you will put the temporary wire? You have to push temporary wire. This is a very unreliable rhythm. Uh, so just stopping the beta blocker will not cut it. Rafik Bhai, you agree? There's no question. I mean, four o'clock, that's the time to put a temporary pacemaker in. <laughs> if the patient was, even if the beta blocker dose was high, I would only wait for temporary if the QRS was narrow, escape rhythm was narrow. But with the white QRS, especially alternating right and left, definitely temporary pacemaker. So I tell you, some of our cardiologists and senior fellows will, will do the following. Stop the beta blocker, put it pacer pad, and then start dopamine or isoprenaline, which is, which is which is absolutely not acceptable, okay? Because it may go into a big trouble in the night because these are not going to help uh, and, and you may be in trouble. Let me tell you a few other things. So the way I look at this EKG, is it tachycardia or bradycardia? This is significant bradycardia and the bradycardia denoted by the RR interval and the RR interval is regular but if you map the PP interval also regular. So PP interval gives you a tail rhythm, uh, a tail rate, and then RR interval gives you the ventricular rate. And now you look at the association. The P and QRS, there is no association. It is totally uh, dissociation. So a tail rate higher, ventricular rate lower, and there is AV dissociation. So this is complete heart block. Question now, where is the escape rhythm coming? Because there is no control of the atria over the ventricle now, and the ventricular escape rhythm is not coming from the junction. It is coming further down the junction. So if it is not coming from the uh, junction and uh, narrow, then the Parkinji system is very infranodal. An infranodal block is very unreliable. So therefore, it is important to uh, pace this patient. Um, if you are the EP guy in the night and you want to do a permanent, please do permanent. But I tell the fellows, at least listen to the heart. There is no aortic stenosis. There is no murmur. And do an echo before putting a permanent device. The, the people sometimes go enthusiastically put a permanent, and then the EF is like 20%. That's that's not acceptable either. So, Ravik, any other comment? No, definitely. I mean, you're good today. I mean, we def we always get echo before we put a permanent yeah. pacemaker in it because it, it really saves a lot of hassle later on. Sir, can I can I yeah. ask you one thing, sir? These patients are uh, like EF is low, but it's not like below 35 dB, 35 percent. So, do we? Take any consideration for like uh, CRT or something like that, sir? CRTD or something, ICD, something like that. If it, it had been less than 35, yes, definitely we would have thought. But if it is like this and EF is around 45. So before Rafik Bay answers, let me answer in a general cardiology way before you deep dive to EP. So if the EF is normal, Good. If the EF is above 35, then you ask yourself, should I open up the Pandora's box now or I can open up the Pandora's box later? Because you can still put a temp permanent pacemaker because EF is good. There is no significant valve disease. And look at the ischemia workup later. Hopefully 
you excluded the valve disease. If the EF is bad, then before we put any device, you really need to look at why the EF is bad. Is it ischemic etiology or non-ischemic etiology in the valve disease? Of course, ECHO will tell you about the valve. But if the valve excluded, then you really need to, if the patient is 30 year old drug abuse or viral myocarditis, you don't need to do a cath probably. But if it is a 70 year old with bad EF and never been worked up before, I think we are obligated before we put a $70,000 ICD device to look at the ischemic etiology. Who knows, it could be significant left main multivessel and by revascularization, patient may's EF may get better so you don't need an ICD device, uh, but you just keep the temporary wire, get the ischemia work up, and then get the year better before you put the uh, more expensive ICD. Yes, sir. Is this patient already had gone CAVG and she is like high risk, uh, high, high ischemic risk? Yeah. Uh, and EF is 45 degree, 45 percent, sorry. So. Yeah. If we just give it like less than 35 percent, there was no question like we'll go for CRT. But when you like 40, 45 EF, and if the NOI is 2, 3, then mm. is it like off level use or we do not use it at all, sir? So, excellent point. The next level of question that patients' um, heart rate actually with the temporary wear and then uh, off beta blocker following morning um, was this, sinus rhythm left bundle. And I'll tell you what we did. Escape rhythm was right bundle. Right, good observation. So there is a chance that he would be paced. So, and then alternative bundle. So we actually went for by the paste, but not ICD. Uh, Atharva, do you have I, any comment? So, yeah. so you have gone for CRTD. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, just to let you know, to avoid confusion, is the, is the how you communicate. We usually, call by V paste and, and CRT, we reserve that term that when we are giving ICD. Mm -hmm. But you and I, we are meaning the same thing. For the audience, what we are talking about that we pace like a by V paste, but there is no ICD. So, there, so uh, the cost may be a little cheaper. So CRT P, sir. P, P, C, R, T, P, S, Correct. Correct. So, you know, uh, one of the things that we do here, the dip, what is the difference between medical care in the United States and, say, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal? We pay meticulous attention to patients. Patient comes to me in Baltimore or Pennsylvania. We try to get record from wherever it it is available so that we can come up with a definitive plan for this patient long term. Um, and then, of course, the question would be um, this one, of course, uh, uh, by the patient. The other option that we do nowadays, we do his bundle pacing. Okay, but that's the, uh, the advantage is that if you have that skill, then you can get narrow QRS without having three wires in the brain. Uh, but, but, but the most important thing that it, these treatments are individualized based on the disease pattern of the patient. In addition, also the, who, who the patient is. So that's so important to do. Thank you. <coughs> so the, this is a 77 year old presenting with exertional dyspnea and told to report to ED because um, the outside uh, EKG was like 40 heart rate and first degree AV block. This was the EKG.
is there something on the downslope of the T wave as seen in V5? Okay, anything else? So this patient, sinus rhythm, prolonged PR, and then electrolytes relatively normal. And then this happened overnight. Yep. Yes. So now, now going into two to one. And this is the same theme that what you want to do, what kind of pacemaker you will give. So the concept is if the patient is requiring too much pacing, then it is better to um, do the by V pace. Um, any comment on Ravik Bhai on his bundle pacing? Because not all EP physicians are fan of his bundle pacing, but some are. Yeah, I mean, it depends on your level of experience. The other problem is that how much dependent the person patient is on the, so this patient had two to one conduction. So probably doing his bundle. The other question is that if the EF is normal, majority of the patient do very well with apical pacing or septal pacing. And uh, so across the board, if you find out the statistics that most people with EF over 50%, will get a, a dual chamber pacemaker. Yeah, people, of course, are more and more getting into bi or his bundle pacing if the EF is lower. So another patient, a 76 year old, and then an incidental COVID, but coming with COPD exacerbation. And then cardiology called in for tele changes overnight. This is the EKG in the beginning, and then this, this problem. Mm -hmm. Any comment? Did the patient pass out? <laughs> so I, I was looking for the timing, Rafik Bhai. Uh, yeah. If you look at carefully, this is uh, 13th of February at 12.32 uh, a.m. At midnight, so he was sleeping. Yeah. What is the body weight? Body weight, uh, I don't know, but... Uh, uh, I, I did see the patient, uh, be, you know, a little bit on the obese side, but not grossly obese. Sure. And we Anybody suspect- any comment on the telly strip? Telly strip. Anybody, any comment? Yeah, Junior, Junior. Uh, Nobody? May I try, sir? No, no, somebody else. We need to give, get others in, uh, engaged into this thing. What's going on? Nobody is coming up. Listen, this is not an exam. This is a discussion and you should participate. Passive listening is okay, but the purpose of this session is not passive listening. You will participate, you will make mistake, I will make mistake and we will fix it later on. And that's how we are going to learn. Um, if we go for this traditional lecture that we used to listen to sit there in the back of the class and keep listening, I attended all the lectures, basically learn nothing. That's not good. That is not the purpose of this session. So please do come forward. 
and talk about these kind of things. Okay, please go ahead. So this is uh, clearly um, long pauses. And the question is with somebody uh, suspecting uh, this obstructive sleep apnea and during sleep, how long pause uh, you tolerate. The patient doesn't have any syncope as Rafik Bhai was asking. And then um, of note, initial RR interval is not multiple of the original RR interval. So this, how you differentiate sinoatrial exit block versus just sinus arrest. Uh, but you, you, your observation is clear, right? That you don't see any activities. So how long you wait before you say this is significant and uh, you need to have a pacemaker backup. This was almost like 10 seconds. Well, I have to, I've seen pause up to 30 seconds. Right. And did nothing. This patient actually was seizing. If that is I wanted somebody to comment on the strip. If you look at the strip, when it the pause, after the pause towards the end, you can see the baseline artifacts. I wonder if in sleep he was seizing or not. Um, without symptom, I mean, it's, it's difficult, and especially this patient is very sick at that time. Um, temporary is, is different, but of course, uh, one will have to really, really clearly debate about the role of pharma and pacemaker in this patient. So, and uh, no, uh, no other pauses noted in the next 30 hours in the hospital. So, in the guidelines, it doesn't say how long, but some EP guys, particularly I call around the West side, more than 10 seconds, they get worried. Is that something arbitrary, Rafik Bhai? No, nobody knows. I mean, listen, what somebody during sleep, sleep apnea patients, that we see young people with obese people, 10, 15 second pause, and we don't put pacemaker in. Right. On the other hand, this guy who never has seen could be just because he's elderly. The other issue would be that sometimes you have to assess the patient, elderly patients, a lot of times they don't report symptoms. If there is a concern about that, that is have to be taken into consideration because there are a lot of elderly people with mild dementia, they will not remember dizzy spells or minor blackout spells. So, you know, we have like 76 participants now the reason I'm showing this because many of us in this group are, are general cardiologists, not the EP docs. Yeah. For us, sometimes it is easy to make the decision for pacemaker. And some of us do the pacemaker and will be very easily vulnerable to make the decision that, oh, pause, take, put a pacemaker. But if it is this, I think the harder part is that to make a wise decision I would say wise, because that is more appropriate than don't jump on putting a pacemaker. And the more importantly, if you are not sure, then ask someone who is the authority in that line and then put a pacemaker. The easy path is to put a pacemaker, but that may be inappropriate. I think that is fair to say. Ravik Bhai, you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. To, for the audience, I don't know if you paid attention to this thing. Hafiz said, I called people along the West Coast. And this is something that we always do. I mean, we always talk to each other. I mean, I have been in practice for 30 plus years. Even then I talked to somebody else who has been in practice for 10 years. And we call around people and find out not to, uh, just to confirm that what I'm doing is the right thing because these are the gray zones that you have to make a decision. Uh, and this is something that I, I think I see a little lacking in, 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 in Southeast Asia uh, because I don't know why, but there is this thing, but we always talk to each other. I mean, we call each other, Hafiz calls me, I call my partners, 
I have called partners who just joined two years ago because they come with new ideas, new brain. And they may have something new that I just didn't pay attention to. Thank you. So, so when you become a doctor, how, when how you become a doctor, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Let's yeah. say the uh, previous patient. Yeah. Apparently he's asymptomatic. But yeah. if they find out his uh, anti-probe NP is quite high, what will be your decision? BNP is high? Yeah. So that's probably preserved EF, BNP high, probably is a component of diastolic dysfunction. Whether uh, that will change the management in terms of pacemaker? Yeah, that's the question I'm asking. Only thing is the syncope is the solid thing that yeah. will go yeah. for yeah. pacemaker. Yeah. yeah. Even dizziness, you scratch your head. So, Hafiz, I mean, yeah. this patient was on metoprolol 12.5 BID. So just recently, I saw another gentleman who was 70 plus and was in neurologist office for stroke evaluation and he dozed off or passed out momentarily. When he came, he was having these pauses, but he was on metoprolol 100 BID and we stopped it. It all disappeared. So that was one case that I'm... And this is also very low dose metoprolol targeted BID, but in elderly, sometimes they actually uh, react more than younger people. Yeah, agree. And uh, and then we 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 did take care of this uh, metoprolol off and then control with um, other medications for the hypertension. Um, so what I was going to say that I usually tell my fellows when you become a physician, you accept everything, you you take everything but you give up one thing for sure, that you give up your ego. Take the ego off when you become a bedside physician because Excellent. you never know the, what will come up on your way. 76 year old, COPD, and then, um, uh, sorry, uh, let me, uh, I showed that one. This is the one that uh, probably will be the case of the day. A 78 year old uh, had cardioversion, pancreatic cancer, Whipple's 2013, hypothyroidism, diabetes, and then uh, came in with uh, some mechanical fall, denies that he has any loss of consciousness. And uh, initial evaluation, the uh, troponin, high sensitivity troponin, fifth generation, some minor temporal change, and then thyroid TSH is high, magnesium little low, and this is the EKG. So any comment on this EKG? Because there will be more to come. Well, the heart has not decided why, which way it will go. <laughs> All sorts of arrhythmia. So it's a, we read it as AFib and then PVC. Yeah. And then this happened overnight. Uh -huh. What was the potassium at that time? Potassium was okay, I think. Uh, so three. Potassium was hypokalemic, so three. No, wait. So three and 1.28 on the day of admission. But it was corrected. So we do not know what was at that time. But the following morning, after this happened, checked a couple of hours later, the report came and the potassium was okay at that time. Magnesium was 1.8, but very good point. There are more to come. That's why I'm, I'm telling you this. <laughs> <laughs> so it was read as, uh, so this is the thing. This, uh, and this is the reason I was very uh, involved. Um, so the fellow read that this is the VTAC, ventricular tachycardia, and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. The, the attending 
said, no, this is a fib with fast ventricular rate and aberrance. True, I am in this favor. And the per, the and the and the attending was EP attending. <laughs> so <laughs> all EP things are like. Hmm? Okay, now the the this happened after that. And now the fellow went back to the EP attending and then came to me. But we both were blinded and saying that, what do you think? So this is again in favor of the AFIB, Chaudhuri. Okay. Any other comment? So fellow was very, very naughty. He showed me this one and told the EP attending that Asan said, this is polymorphic VT. And then, <laughs> then meaning that I supported him on this one also, which I did not even see. So my question to you, Atharvai, mm -hmm. is it two different arrhythmias or same? a fib happening here also because Sorry? when i looked at this oh. i thought that there is irregularity in this one the green one there is there is irregularity of the rr interval although there is some amplitude variation but here it looks like wider and uh, and and different than and pretty regular so this is in favor of the AFIVS because the initial part clearly shows the irregularity of the RR interval and there is no POF. So the initial part of the strip is in favor of the atrial fibrillation. Just before the wide QRS complex, there is long short interval. There is a, just before the uh, wide complex, there is a short pause, long pause, short pause. So these pauses can cause this variation of the uh, refractory period and causes of the widening of the QRS complexes. And this widening in not against the VTS because the widening in the same direction of the sign that is the previous uh, conducted bit. If it are the VT, it should be go usually opposite direction. That is, you see, the, the, the direction is the same. That is the conducted QRS and the wide QRS in the same direction. Usually in case of the VT, it should happen downwards. So irregularity, and the same direction in favor of the VT, that is the AP with aberrancy. Okay. So Hafiz, if can I you show go you back? this. Hafiz, go back, yeah. please. Go back, yeah. please. More. One more back, please. Okay. So let, no, no, that's ECG. Um, next one. Yeah, next one. No, the next click is, yeah. So, I mean, look at the top strip. If you look at the top strip, the one that is marked N, 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 and then the first one is says S, and then says V. Look at the change in morphology. It is changing gradually. So the first one that is marked S is probably a fusion bit. I'll tell you why I think it's fusion. If you look at the second rhythm strips, look at even though the rate is fast, it's not aberrantly conducted. So those first five or six bits, I think those are ventricular. And then it becomes normal and look at the first two bits of the, again, the white complex, there is a fusion and then changes. So I think, and then it goes into a field. And then the, in the bottom, you can see regular white QRS. So, I think that's initially non-sustained first couple of fusion bits. And then if we, and the next one, it will be hard pressed not to call it VT. Unless somebody can show me a 12 lead that shows that it's just the lead position. Sometimes you get funny looking um, QRS complexes. And then this, this long short uh, concept traffic by, but the, if there is any aberrancy, in the uh, FE with aberrancy, do you see change in axis or it is 
just aberrancy taking a uh, change in morphology like uh, becomes an aberrant bundle branch, but okay. you don't see any axis change. Uh, uh, all right, so let me explain this to you. Let's look at the top strip. The, I'm looking at the three mark N and N. If I assume that is V6, looks like V6, right? Or lead one. In that case, you would have seen a tall R wave with a terminal S wave, not so deep. That will be right bundle aberration. If you are left bundle aberration, you will see a wide left bundle type. So that QRS complex does not fit into our classic aberrant QRS complex pattern. Mm -hmm. That makes me think that this is not aberration. Correct. And then in the lower panel, that in the very lower panel, that clearly there is a change in axis from N, N, N to V, 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 and then very wide. So this is probably double tachycardia, a fib going into polymorphic VT. Yeah. So can I ask you, all the young doctors that are, why are you just talking about this stupid ECG? You know, there is a reason for it. We can just pass by and call it a fib with RVR or make our brain think. And that is the whole point that we are trying to do here. That we don't, you don't ignore anything. You don't just pass by, oh, hey, this is a fib with RBI and then go away. And if we do that, the day we start doing it, that's the day we are going to miss VT, which yeah. will become disastrous for the patient. Yep. R and then, and there, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead, Tushar. Sir, uh, I, have a, I have a question to both of you. Sir, is that the initial uh, irregularity supports VT more than the AFib? Because we you know in VT, there can be a variable heart rate initially. And the lower panel, the wideness of the QRS and the regularity that later comes on, uh, clearly suggesting VT. And it's the VT that can have some irregularity in the initial part. Is it possible, sir? You see, Irregular, the, I'll, I'll put it the other way. Just because something is irregular doesn't mean that it cannot be VT. Yeah. And uh, uh, we actually encourage our fellows to look at the cycle length tediously and see whether there is any pattern in the cycle length. Uh, because unless you are very meticulous in measuring cycle length, the eyeball cannot be very reliable when the ventricular rate is too fast. Okay, so, so what happened uh, next? Yeah. Go ahead, Hafiz. So now I just wanted to no. show you. Can, that Hafiz, can this, you go back? There is something, some clue here. <laughs> Go back. I was going to come back to that. Okay. Yeah, go. So we wait. Don't pay attention to the top. Look at the end where it stops. You see, aberration will not stop like that. If it was if you with RVR with aberrant conduction, it will gradually slow down. Will not suddenly switch morphology. Yeah. And it stops. Thanks. So this was the echo, uh, and I told you that this patient had a uh, Whipple surgery and this LV is bad. So any, any suggestion what to do next? Jamil Bhai, what is the position? Well, I mean, you need to do the full work. I mean, the first thing is that if you see white QRS, you rule out ischemia. I mean, I prefer CAT to be done. Oh, you did the CAT. Okay. What did you find? So this was the left dominant system. We did the CAT. And the, this is uh, like a dual ostia 
uh, uh, LED and start coming separately. Nothing striking in the calf to explain for the cardiomyopathy. There is plaque, there is calcification. And then we did the osteal LAD, IFR, uh, FFR also, and a negative, right is non-dominant. Now what? Sir, the and by the way, uh, to answer Wadud's question, this second episode happened when the magnesium and the potassium were normal, but magnesium was given more. And also like anywhere else, um, they gave amiodarone IV also. Um, and then uh, amiodarone infusion that later on was stopped when the patient came to sinus. I mean, a uh, rate control, FE. So what is the calculated EF, Hafiz? EF, uh, well, the calculation is eyeball calculation, but yeah. the EF is, EF is like a semi-quantitative 20% uh, EF. Okay. And then there was a plural effusion. Yeah. Sir, he's uh, looking at his echo. Septal was, septal wall was uh, very, a bit hypokinetic and there was some increased uh, sort of a thickening. So uh, I want to rule out the uh, amyloidosis, sir. Just came in mind. I may be wrong, but it first struck me, the septal wall, looking at the septal wall. Okay, so uh, since you mentioned this, it is, a, uh, it is important to mention that cardiac amyloid in an infiltrative cardiomyopathy can give rise to uh, in, uh, LV dysfunction later, and then wall thickness. Um, and then for the ATR amyloid, we are now doing the pyrophosphate scan. This is not the AL amyloid that we, are, we know from multiple myeloma and amyloid. So it is a completely different. And the reason we are meticulous now about it, because there is a treatment available, although this is very expensive. But think about this patient, that this is a patient with Whipple's multiple chemotherapy and then has cardiomyopathy and non-ischemic. So we thought that this is most likely chemo related and not any infiltrative cardiomyopathy, right? And God will be really unkind. Uh, I don't know why I'm bringing God here, but uh, to have two bad diseases at the same time. He has enough already <laughs> with the whipples and then pancreatic C and all that. Um, and, 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 and now has bad EF. And in, in addition, we are suspecting amyloid. Uh, so we did not go that route, although this was actually discussed in the conference. And are you an EP doc also? Oh, uh, sir, I work in the EP department. In, in Perfect, team. because <laughs> I see that all the EP docs think about the same line, but I did not pursue further for the pyrophosphate scan, and I'll tell you why. And that, that is one of the reasons I'm showing this case, that why I'm not showing, pursuing Hafiz, that. I have, a, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what is the status of pancreatic cancer? Oh, Ravik, I love you. That, the, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is the key, that is the key, that whatever we do, we need to understand this. But let me tell you this, a little bit um, further about the polymorphic VT that, you know, th this is sometimes a problem. And you can see that the atrial arrhythmias with ventricular pre-excitation, even artifact can be sometimes a, a, a mimicry. Um, and then if you go to the left side, then they talk about long QT and not long QT, and then you know, whether this is polymorphic or this is torsad, I think that is important to consider, but, but even more important is to see whether there is any organic heart disease, ischemia, valve disease. And then in the young population, 
think about the channelopathies and then uh, catecholam catecholaminergic uh, induced VT. Pulse dependent can be an issue. So drug induced, bradycardia in the long QT, and then post tachycardia, sometimes long pause. In our patients, that actually happened probably. Um, and then you can see this in even in Takasubu, we, we have seen that in the COVID time also. So short coupling interval, and then induce the polymorphic VT, you cannot differentiate. The left one, I took it from the, uh, from the book that it is on the young patients with uh, catecholamine in, uh, uh, dependent polymorphic VT. And in the right side, this is actually a STEMI patient where the short coupling interval and then induction of the uh, polymorphic VT. So it is important to rule out structural heart disease, coronary ischemia, and then uh, decide about what to do. So back to our patient. ICD, when we, if we summarize this, that, uh, that what is the purpose of giving the ICD to prevent sudden cardiac death? Is it a primary prevention or secondary prevention? In our patient, this is secondary prevention because it sustained the polymorphic VT. But more importantly, it is also important to, to look at the presence of comorbidities. So, and this is a risk and benefit that we are preventing sudden cardiac death and nasty ventricular arrhythmia and abort. And by time, on the other hand, what is the comorbidities? What is the procedural risk? And I'm sure cost is an important issue. So in our patient, we asked the, the oncologist, the, what is the likelihood of this patient's survival? I don't know um, what you follow, but generally, even for secondary prevention, even for secondary prevention, one year survival is the key to follow. If the survival is poor, then we don't want to put an ICD even for secondary prevention. And that's why we are asking the prognosis as Rafik Bai pointed out. And then we talked to the oncologist, they're waiting for some scans. So not ideal, not ideal, but we just give the guidelines directed medical therapy for LV dysfunction uh, because of the cardiomyopathy. And then we actually uh, wanted to know the prognosis initially we um, planned for live vest to buy time, but the scan came in as the recurrence of the malignancy. And, uh, and therefore I did not go for any infiltrative cardiomyopathy to look for. And the prognosis was not more than six months. So he did not get the ICD. You know, it's, it's, it's so important. So I'll give you an example of a patient that I saw recently. He was, I think 87, very fit 87 year old, came with sustained monomorphic VT, a cardiomyopathy. But he said, Dr. Ahmed, I just want to attend my granddaughter's wedding in July and my great grandchild's first birthday in September. So we made a decision in consultation with the patient that we're going to give him a life vest until that first birthday, and then after that, he will decide what to do. And, and of course, this is another situation where this is where we really need to get involved and talk to patients in a very, very, um, as a patient advocate um, and, and make a decision what to do. Thank you. Yeah. So, so we did not go any further. Do we have used, sir? Yeah. For rate control and this. Was that? Sir, for medical therapy, what drug did we like choose, sir? So we actually used amiodarone, uh, PO, and also carvedilol. Thank you, sir. And if it, uh, like the prognosis is was good, then uh, would you consider ICD or CRT, sir?
So this patient less. No, no, we were considering. Was good. Like, I would I would say I'm not the expert on the ICD, but I would just give a single chamber ICD. I would not put by V ICD because uh, the patient is not really or probably would not be dependent on um, pacer. So in a cancer patient, I put it very bluntly. If the cancer is cured, I say, look, I am going to treat you like a normal person. If the cancer is not cured, then I ask him, do you want to die in agony or die suddenly of VF? And I'm not, I don't put it so bluntly to the patient, but we actually put it the question that way. Look, which one would you prefer? And that's how you have to make a decision of ICD implant in cancer patients. And of course, the CRTD part depends on the patient's symptom um, and um, uh, ECG presentation, um, uh, all those things. Um, and I remember that this is a very sick patient. So this patient uh, symptom will be very, very difficult to assess. Yes, I was, I was yes, hoping that we find a ischemia substrate and we can take care of it. The most powerful uh, anti-arrhythmic is uh, anti-ischemia therapy. Yeah, go ahead, Tushar. Sir, uh, regarding the uh, ICD, sir, many times we see the patients we are treating with ICD needs anti-arrhythmic drugs, which later on results in conduction abnormality and they requires also pacing. So uh, those patients who are gonna need antiarrhythmics, are they better suited for dual chamber and uh, ICD? So the question is, will you put a dual chamber defibrillator for patients because patients may need antiarrhythmic? We don't because not all anti will cause conduction system disease. Um, if they declare themselves, if we treat somebody with anti and we find that they have a problem that they will need dual chamber system, yes, we'll do it. Um, remember one thing that I used to do, a majority of my patients used to be dual chamber ICD, but that you were adding extra hardware, you were taking the risk of complication, lead disturbance, all those things. So now I, I really want them to prove themselves that they need a dual chamber system. So Tushar, we are learning from the world history that preemptive strike doesn't work. We learned this in Iraq that you have a 50% uh, plaque. So you strike preemptively, it doesn't work. And yes, then, exactly. and then <laughs> you can join NATO. So do preemptive strike, and then you make a mess. So preemptive strike, I think, Definitely, there is no role for preemptive strike in interventional cardiology. Preemptive, there is no role. And now I'm hearing that there is no role for preemptive strike in EP either. So uh, let's take care of things that is on hand. So, sir, sir, uh, this is this is 1045. So yeah. uh, we can conclude the session. Before conclusion, I'd like to request Professor Rohikamad sir to say uh, some words regarding the presentation and our program, and then we should conclude. Rohikamad sir. Sorry, well, Kushal, I, I was a little not, late. I was not. I was not planning to attend the session, but I'm glad that I did. It, it was an enjoyable session, a beautiful session, and of course, I hope that our audience took something from it. Um, from this and Hafiz, of course, uh, I, I, if I, I will always say good things about Hafiz. So, that, so I'm not going to say it because he deserves it. It's not that I say it because he, I like him, but he deserves it. Um, the part that I like about Hafiz is he is a true and true Bangladeshi, and uh, there are not many um, in uh, when uh, around in Bangladesh there are many, but outside, uh, yes, uh, not many like Hafiz. Uh, it's always a pleasure and my privilege to know him. Thanks, Hafiz. One thing that I, I wanted to say, the I, I, I really enjoy having the attendees and please ask us questions. We are not your examiners. We are your, your uh, senior colleagues, uh, maybe because I'm old, uh, but please feel free. And this is the time I tell my fellows, whatever you ask, whatever you do, 
whatever mistakes, this is your time to do that. Once you graduate, there'll be nobody around you. Uh, so you will be on your own. So it is better that you do all these things now. And don't be shy. And just ask. And you will you will find out that there are people who do not ask. They are not any better than you. So please participate. It will be more fun if you say your things. And, and Rafiq Bhai and I, we always say this, and you also know that your teachers, and uh, when uh, uh, Wadud or Atar Bhai, they are, they are your examiners, but I know that they will not penalize you for asking questions. I can guarantee that. <laughs> Wadud, you will support that? <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> so it will not go against you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Tushar. Sir. It is special thanks to our Vishal Sreshta and Sitro Rasharma from Nepal. And Urun Maske after a long time. Urun Maske. Yeah, Urun, I yeah. we are seeing you after a long time. Yeah, so I was yeah. absent for some time. Yeah, yeah, I was absent for some time. <laughs> nice I to must see tell you this, the people, that our participants from Nepal, they talk because of uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Arun Maski. I yeah, think yeah. he's much more friendly than our Bangladeshi faculty to their uh, students. <laughs> so, uh, Arun Maski, we are waiting for your session in uh, when shortly. Yeah, I'll see you uh, in Dhaka. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Arun, uh, welcome, welcome. If okay. you'll be coming in the IPDA conference. Okay. Said, I'll, some... I'll be also coming for Sky also. Okay, na? 23rd uh, to 27th. Okay. Said, oh, oh, I'll I'll meet you there. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're coming to Sky? Yeah, the Bangladesh Sky. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And Hafiz Bhai, you can join in our program with, through Zoom. We will be arranging that. <laughs> we are lucky <laughs> that Rafiq Sir is here. Yeah. So he'll be in person. So, okay. Abdul Aziz Choudhury, please. Concluding uh, remarks, Abdul Aziz Choudhury. Well, any session from Choudhury Hafiz al Hassan and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor of Hisar, they are very much enjoyable for two reasons. They bring beautiful, challenging cases, and then they explain it beautifully. Uh, so, we can enjoy it. Uh, most of us, are not EP guys, as Hafiz Bhai used to say. So these challenging cases, when they are explained, that it makes sense to us. Today's cases are important in other context that, that they help us to gain some insight, when to do, what to do, and when not to do. Uh, that's very important. Thank you, Hafiz Bhai. Thank you, Rufik sir. Thank you, audience, uh, for joining with us. So thanks everybody for next session in 27th of this month. Thank you everybody for the next session. No, no, excellent. Mane asked uh, all the cases were I don't know how he prepared these cases. Unbelievable. Interesting, sir. This is a complicated thing. We have a patient who has a lot of comments. The last case is a little bit. We have a lot of people. At the Google stage, we have a patient who has a lot of people. We have a lot of people who have a lot of people. We have a lot of people. Exactly, sir. We have a lot of people who have a lot of people who approach a lot of people. Most of the time. Most of the time. Actually, we don't have to do aggressive treatment. We don't have to do aggressive treatment. We don't have to do aggressive treatment. Integrated management data. Private sector, government sector, integrated management data. We don't have to do aggressive treatment. We don't have to do aggressive treatment. We don't have to do aggressive treatment. Respiratory medicine specialist, endocrinologist. We have to do aggressive treatment. We don't have to do aggressive treatment. कोनो केस जो दिया आशे ये पेशेंट गुलो किंतु सर आम्रा आम्रा लूजो कोरी एवं इधर मैनेजमेंट टा होता आम्रा अप टू द मार्क मैनेजमेंट आम्रा होते दिखते पड़ी नहीं बिकॉज़ ऑफ़ द टाइम कंस्ट्रेंट और कोऑर्डिनेटेड एप्रोच इट करूँ कुछ डिफिकल्ट है अच्छा हम बोलेंगे अगेन थैंक्स टू शादेश तक्रबर्ती श
Thank you so much, Sadhu, for your being with us. Sadhish Takrabati, Wali Ul Islam. Wali Ul Islam, Sadhu, Chilen. Kabul left. MG Azam, actually, I got MG Azam, Jilu Rahman. Thanks, everybody, for staying with us. Thank you, sir, and good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Special thanks to Rivu. Thank you.